I'm Mark Bowling, one of the instructors at Palo Alto Networks, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about how to understand the relationship between the NAP policy and the security policy on the Palo Alto Networks firewall. One of the challenges of the Palo Alto Networks firewall is explaining to an end user how to create NAT security rules in a way that's easy for them to remember. Often the phrase pre-NAT IP, post-NAT zone is employed to describe how our NAT works, but often the end user is left confused as to how it applies. Many people think it applies either to the NAT policy or to the security policy or both, and this confusion tends to leave our end users thinking that our NAT process is overly confusing. I'd like to demonstrate a simple method of describing NAT that works in all scenarios, and also show how bidirectional NAT rules can cause problems in specific situations. To start off, there are four questions that you should ask in a specific order that will help better explain our NAT process. Question 1. What is the original source address of the computers initiating the connection? Question 2. What zone is that address in? Question 3. What is my original destination address? And Question 4. What zone is that address or collection of addresses in? The questions regarding the NAP policy and the security policy are identical, with the exception of the last question on the security policy. That would be question 4, what zone will the packet finally come to rest in? In this first example, we want to create simple NAT and security policy rules that will allow internet access for computers on the inside subnet. Our inside zone is using the 10.1.1.0/24 subnet, and the outside zone is going to use the 66.1.1.1 IP address for translation out to the internet. So let's start with the first question. What's the original source address of the computers initiating the connection? In our case, it's 10.1.1.0/24. Question 2, what zone is that address in? This address range is in the inside zone, so we'll choose that for the source zone here. Question 3, what is my original destination address? Since we're trying to allow general internet access, here we can use any for the destination address and we will further refine that by asking question 4. What zone is that address or collection of addresses in? Of course that would be the outside zone. Now since we're not trying to select a particular outside address to translate our traffic to, we don't need to put it in a particular service, so we'll just select any here for the service. Then we'll choose dynamic IP import as our source translation type and assign our interface address as the translated address for outbound packets. And then next we'll go and configure the security policy rule that will control the traffic out to the internet. All the NAP policy does is define how we will translate IPs, but it has nothing to do with allowing or denying traffic. Now let's ask almost the same exact questions when setting up the security policy rule so we can allow traffic out to the internet. Question 1, what is my original source address of the computers initiating the connection? In our case it's 10.1.1.0.24. In question 2, what zone is that address in? This address range is in the inside zone, so we'll choose that for the source zone here. Question 3, what is my original destination address? Since we're trying to allow general internet access, we will use any for the destination address. Then we change question 4 when talking about the security policy rule. Question 4 is, what zone will the packet finally come to rest in? In other words, when that packet lands on its final destination, what zone will it actually be in from the firewall's perspective? In this case, our packet is destined for a server out on the internet. As far as the firewall is concerned, that's the outside zone. Just keep in mind that when dealing with a security policy, that the source zone and both the source and destination addresses refer to pre-NAT IP information. Only the destination zone refers to post-NAT information. That's why Palo Alto Networks refers to pre-NAT IP post-NAT zone. Our source IP and the security policy is the IP address before it goes through the NAT process, and the destination zone is where the packet comes to rest after going through the NAT process. Finally, we tell it what application to match and set the action to allow. Okay, so now that we've created the basic Internet Access Policies, let's say that we have a web server in our DMZ zone called Server 1 that we want to allow access to from the Internet. Let's start by asking the same questions in the same order that we asked the first time. So let's start with the first question. Question 1, what is my original source address for the computers initiating the connection? In this case, we want to allow anyone on the internet to get to our server, so the source address would be any. Question 2, in what zone are those addresses in? Internet addresses are in our outside zone, so we'll choose that for the source zone here. Question 3, what is my original destination address? Since people on the internet will be accessing a public IP address to get to our server, we'll put in the public IP that we've chosen here in the destination address field because this is the original address that the user tried to get to. In question 4, what zone is that address in? 
Of course, our public IP would be in the outside zone of our firewall. Since we're not trying to determine where the final packet goes based on the service, we'll just select any for the service. And since we need to translate packets from the internet to a specific destination inside our network, we'll choose the 192.168.1.100 IP address as the destination NAT address. Now our destination RAT policy rule is complete, and we can go ahead and set up the appropriate security policy rule to allow traffic to reach our server. Let's start by asking the same questions in the same order that we asked the first time. Question 1. What is my original source address of the computers initiating the connection? We want to allow any address on the internet to get to our server, so we'll choose any here. Question 2. What zone is that address in? Internet addresses are in our outside zone, so we'll choose outside for the source zone here. Question 3. What is my original destination address? Internet users are going to try to get to our server using the firewall's public IP address that we've associated with the server, so we'll enter 66.1.1.2 here. And remember that question 4 is slightly different. What zone will the packet finally come to rest in? In this case, our packet is destined for our internal server, which is in our DMZ zone, so that's what we'll choose here. Then we just allow web browsing on its default port and our server access configuration is complete. Now let's say you're just about all done, and someone comes along and tells you that even though people on the internet can reach your web server using its public IP, nobody on the inside zone can get to your server using its public IP. The reason is because when people on the inside zone go to the 66.1.1.2 address, the packet goes out like it's going to end up on the server in the outside zone. But since your server is in the DMZ zone, their packets just get dropped. To fix this issue, you need to go back to your policies and ask the same questions all over again. So the scenario is, computers on the inside zone need to access server 1 in the DMZ zone using its public IP address in the outside zone. That sounds complicated, but as you can see in just a second, if you just ask the same questions in the same order as always, it's no more complicated than any other NAT question. Here we go. Starting with the NAT policy. Question 1. What is the original source address of the computers initiating the connection? In this case, we want to allow anyone on the inside zone to get to our server, so the source address would be any. Question 2. And what zone are those addresses in? Inside addresses are in our inside zone, so we'll choose that for the source zone here. Question 3. What is my original destination address? Since people on the inside zone will be accessing the public IP address to get to our server, we'll put in the public IP that we've chosen here in the destination address field because this is the original address that the user tried to get to. And question 4. And what zone is that address in? Of course, our public IP would be in the outside zone of our firewall. We still don't care about translating our traffic based on service, and we're still trying to get the traffic to a specific destination, so all the rest of our values stay the same. Now we go to the security policy and just jump right into the questions. Question 1. What is the original source address of the computers initiating the connection? We want to allow any address on the inside zone to get to our server, so we'll choose any here. Question 2. What zone are those addresses in? Inside addresses are in our inside zone, so we'll choose inside for the source zone here. Question 3. What is my original destination address? Inside users are trying to get to our server using the firewall's public IP address that we've associated with the server, so we'll enter 66.1.1.2 here. And question 4, which is still a little bit different. What zone will the packet finally come to rest in? In this case, our packet is destined for our internal server, which is on our DMZ zone, so that's what we'll choose here. Now if you'll take a look, you'll notice that the new NAT and security policy rules look identical to their predecessors, with the exception of the source zone. Because of that, we can consolidate these rules into one. It'll give you the same functionality, and it looks cleaner too. And now we've completed what sounded to be a somewhat complicated NAT requirement by asking the same questions that we ask for every other NAT situation. Now, I want to talk about an issue that is caused by using bidirectional NAT rules. Here's the scenario. A company has two servers and has created a bi-directional NAT policy rule for each one. Server 1 has a NAT rule configured to use the 66.1.1.10 outside IP address to reach a public host at 24.1.2.3. The administrator configured it for static NAT and checked the bi-directional NAT box so that the firewall would automatically create the corresponding destination NAT rule. Server 2 also has a NAT rule configured to use the 66.1.1.10 outside IP address to reach a public host at 208.4.5.6. The administrator also configured it for static NAT and checked the bidirectional checkbox so that the firewall would automatically create a corresponding destination NAT rule. Checking the bidirectional NAT box is convenient. It automatically creates a NAT in the reverse direction as the original one that was defined, 
but it doesn't show up in the web UI. You can only see this automatically created NAT rule from the CLI. This is sometimes used as a shortcut when people don't understand how to properly create destination NATs, so they create a source NAT instead and let the firewall do the rest of the work. Now when the administrator checked the bidirectional NAT box, what he thought the firewall was doing automatically behind the scenes is this. But during his troubleshooting, he noticed that no traffic was matching server 2, and all inbound traffic from the outside zone was being forwarded to server 1 instead. In reality, when he checked the bidirectional NAT box, this is what was actually created. When the bidirectional NAT box is checked, the reverse direction NAT is created with any for the source address and the source zone. Because of this, when traffic comes in from 208.4.5.6, instead of forwarding to server 2, it gets forwarded to server 1 because of the any statement in the source address of the first rule. Therefore, traffic will always match rule 1 and will never match rule 2. If the administrator had just created two separate unidirectional NAT rules that were configured to do what he wanted in the first place, this problem would have never happened. When creating bidirectional NAT rules, be aware that this could be the end result if you're not careful. Now finally, let's look at the occasions that require the service to be defined in the NAT policy rule instead of using any for the service. We only need to define the service in the NAT policy rule when we're trying to choose the destination of a packet based on the port that the packet is using. Look at this NAT rule base. Rule 1 and 2 are source NATs, and Rule 3 and 4 are destination NATs. Rule 1 says that when the server initiates traffic to the outside zone using TCP 123, NAT is using the 66.1.1.10 IP address. But when it initiates traffic to the outside zone using TCP 161, NAT is using the 66.1.1.20 IP address. Because we define the service in the source NAT rule, we can choose the outside address that the server will use when using different services. Rules 3 and 4 are configured as destination NATs where one outside IP address is being used to send traffic to two different internal servers based on the service of the received packet. Rule 3 will NAT packets to server 2 when someone is trying to make a connection on TCP 80 to 66.1.1.30, but when someone is trying to make a connection on TCP 25 to that same public IP address, we'll forward those packets to server 3. Just remember, as long as you don't need to use a service as a matching criteria to decide what IP address packets will use when coming from or going to their final destination, just leave the service as any in the NAT policy rule. And that's all there is for this segment on NAT. I hope it helps. I'm Mark Bowling with Palo Alto Networks.